Hello and welcome. This is Gray Hughes of Gray Hughes Investigates on YouTube. This channel evaluates all aspects of true crime. As you are aware, videos and live streams in this genre often discuss elements of crime that may be disturbing to some viewers. If necessary, take the precautions needed to avoid these feelings. Factual information related to cases is the key to fostering rational true crime discussions. Fortunately, you will find that here. Please hit the like button only once. Share the video and subscribe if you like my content. Thank you very much for watching. See the dogs anywhere? Notifications aren't going out again. Thank you to K Me. All right. So the thing is, uh, here here's the deal, everybody. Like we're we're way behind everybody else that's been talking about this case for a long time, and so it's too hard to manage. Like, hey, don't give away, you know. So if people want to come in here and say something, you know, you don't, just don't look at it, right? I mean, if you don't want to look at it, you don't look at it. But either way, you know, it's like we're so far behind in the case that uh, obviously there's going to be people out there that know all the different information and they're going to want to say something. And, you know, it's okay, all right? So let's just forget <laughs> blocking comments and so forth all right it's not a, it's not a big deal you know it's bothersome you know because it's sort of like uh, you're already getting a, a bias filter but um, you know what's so one of the things that's sort of interesting in this case is that uh, I remember about I don't know months ago I remember seeing something about a, a possible federal investigation you know of the investigators all right and so it turns out where, you know, just recently there's something there, you know, like the, the investigation into the investigators by like the Justice Department and other people uh, are coming forward soon. And, you know, it's a decision will have to be made which direction to go in the case. So if you have something like that, then, you know, maybe there is something to the, uh, what do you call it, the, I don't know, the conspiracy angle, but it's more, I think it's going to be more like what I was telling you. It's not a widespread, huge thing throughout the entire, like, law enforcement, but the people in a small, close-knit group, perhaps, did something, you know, I mean, I, we don't know because we don't know what the information is, but it's an ongoing investigation. I mean, that's pretty interesting, right? Look at Blue, doesn't he? He almost looks back to normal, doesn't he? Look at him. <laughs> yeah. So I guess it's hard then to look at it without at least kind of looking at you know like yesterday when we were talking about the you know various things that you know uh i think i don't i don't know if it was um i don't remember which friend it was maybe it was McNe mccabe who said that she told her to look up on the internet a whole bunch of times you know how long does it take to freeze in the cold and then all of a sudden, that's one of the searches that the defense team was able to get from the uh, Celebrite that there was a search done looking for that from her phone. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, at like 2.20 when the body wasn't even discovered at 6, you know, till 6 in the morning. 
right? So if um, Karen Reed was the one saying, hey, you should look this up. I mean, why did you look it up four hours before she said that? It almost seems more like, like I was saying yesterday, that it's a, a cover-up moment where you're trying to explain why you looked something up. So you claim that they said it. You just didn't realize that they'd have be able to figure out the time frame. Now, law enforcement disputes that time frame information, of course. Now, we don't know if they both searched it up. The only person that we know that searched it was, uh, I believe, McCabe. Uh, and I think that, okay, yeah, Jennifer McCabe is the sister of the homeowner's wife. So oh, there you go. I mean, are you guys uh, interested, though, to go over this case? I mean, I don't know. Just, uh, <laughs> just checking. And thanks up there to K Me up there. Missed that earlier. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so we'll take a look at this. Uh, this is that same document by Sleuthy Goosey here, where it talks about, uh, and this is a timeline, so maybe this is a good way just to sort of understand it. Victim and his nephew go to, uh, there's a D&E pizza. So that the victim is nephew, but he, I think he's the parent of the nephew because he adopted them. And then Nicole Albert meets her sister, Julie, and it's Julie McCabe, or not Julie McCabe, excuse me, Julie, your sister Julie McCabe, somebody else. Julie Albert is the sister. Um, Thanks, Sirius Black. So, uh, let's see, Nicole Albert meets her sister, Julie, daughter, Tristan, and her boyfriend out at dinner at the waterfall. So, she was there at 7.30, Nicole Albert and her sister, Julie, etc. And then, um, at 7.37, victim John O'Keefe walks into C.F. McCarthy's bar wearing jeans, black sneakers, and a gray and dark gray long sleeve shirt and dark baseball hat with an American flag on the front. Uh, with his friend uh, Michael Camerano. And so there is C.F. McCarthy's right there, an Irish bar. And then if you just go down the street right here, this is the location where um, they all kind of went later. It's just right down the street. It's not far at all, which is just this building right here. This is the Waterfall Bar and Grill right here. So right there, the waterfall, bar and grill, that's where everybody was at and then left from there to um, head on over to um, another police officer's home for like an hour or two. And, you know, John O'Keefe apparently never made it there, but the defense team thinks that he made it there. And they're trying to use that to explain, you know, that he got beat up inside the house and that the dog inside the house is what created the wounds on his arm, etc. All right, so at 851, Karen Reed walks into C.F. McCarthy's. So uh, the victim was there first. He got there, um, let's see. John O'Keefe was there at 737. Then the victim's nephew leaves their house for a sleepover at a friend's house at 8 o'clock. Uh, Julie, uh, let's see, victim John O'Keefe walks into C.F. McCarthy's bar wearing jeans. Oh, that's right. So he went home and then he went out, the nephew went over for a sleepover and then John O'Keefe headed over to C.F. McCarthy's and he was with his friend Michael Camerano. Then at 8 o'clock, you know, that's when the nephew leaves the house 
to go to a friend's house. And then Julie Albert texts the victim, uh, telling him she's at Waterfall and to get down there. So Julie Albert uh, contacts John O'Keefe and says, hey, come down the Waterfall. It's just right down the street there. Hey, thanks, Robin. Yeah, I hardly anybody watch those videos, Robin. Not sure why, but just is what it is, I guess. And so Julie Albert texts the victim, telling him she's at Waterfall and to get down there. Karen Reed then walks into C.F. McCarthy's at 8.51. That text was 8.45. Wearing a black jacket, black boots, black pants, and a handbag, small purse, and white shirt underneath her jacket. The bartender hands Karen Reed, this is at 8.58, a tall cylinder style glass containing clear liquid with a lime in it. Then at 9 o'clock, Jennifer and Matt McCabe meet Nicole Albert and her sister Julie at the Waterfall Bar. Yeah, and so Jennifer and Matt McCabe, Jennifer is Nicole Albert's sister and Matt McCabe is Jennifer's husband. And they go there, they meet all up at 9 p.m. at the waterfall. And then also at 9, Karen Reed meets the victim at C.F. McCarthy's bar in Canton, where the victim had been with friends prior to her arrival. Uh, Nicholas, uh, that's weird. So they say, why does it say at 8.58, bartender hands Karen Reed a tall cylinder glass. And then at 9, Karen Reed meets the victim. I mean, wouldn't she have already met him? at 8.58 up there. It's a tiny little place. And then somebody named the, uh, Nicholas Colicathus uh, arrives at the Waterfall Bar. Then the victim hands Karen Reed a cylinder glass with a clear liquid and lime in it. That's at 9.15. Then Karen Reed receives a shot glass with clear liquid in it, which is subsequently pours into a cylinder glass that's at 9.20, and then Karina uh, Kolkathus arrives at the Waterfall Bar. Karen Reed receives a shot glass, at this is at 9.33, with clear liquid in it, which she subsequently pours into her cylinder glass. Then at 9.57, bartender hands Karen Reed a tall cylinder glass with a clear liquid in it, and a shot glass with a clear liquid in it. Then at 10 o'clock, Brian Albert and Nicole Albert arrive at the Waterfall Bar. And Brian Albert and Nicole Albert are the house that everybody goes to later. They own the house. Brian Albert meets his wife at the Waterfall Bar when he returns to, to New York, uh, from New York City. That was at 10 p.m. And 1022, Karen Reed receives a shot glass with a clear liquid in it which is subsequently, pour, she pours into a cylinder glass. Then at 9.29, Karen Reed receives a shot glass with a clear liquid in it, which she subsequently pours into her cylinder glass. Then at 10.40, victim Karen Reed leaves the bar and Karen is holding her last drink in her right hand as they exit the door to the establishment. Julie Albert's last text to the victim is at 10.41 uh, 1054, victim and Karen Reed, so John and Karen, enter the Waterfall Bar. It's, it's weird that they left the bar at 1040, and then they enter at 1054. So they, they leave. The timing doesn't work. You know, like right there, this would take two minutes. To get here so something you know who knows what they were doing but you know they were talking about something maybe maybe arguing I mean who really knows but there's literally right in that situation about 13 minutes of missing time uh, where they don't enter the building here thank you Kubi yes yeah, so we tried saying last night Remember that, Kubi? Waterfall bar five times fast. Nobody could do it. Yeah, so it's 1040. Victim and Karen leave the bar, and Karen is holding her last drink in her right hand as they exit the door. 
and then at 10:54, 14 minutes later, just like you know, 200 feet away, victim and Karen enter the waterfall bar. Then at 11 o'clock, Karen Reed and the victim, John, arrive at the water. Why does it say that again? Karen Reed and the victim arrive at the waterfall bar. Oh, these are people saying, you know, estimating a time here. This right here is actual time because that's video footage, video footage. So 1040 to 1054, and some of these other people just said around 11, which is, you know, it's close, six minutes. That just shows you like in the Idaho 4 case when Dylan Mortensen says, oh, around, you know, 4 a.m., that's what she's talking about. I mean, it could be 4.07, could be 4.08, etc. Right? Yeah, anyways, people can, you can just say what you want to say. So you, nobody needs to be blocking anybody or anything like that. Just say what you, you know. Because people, I mean, we're so late to this case. I mean, we've been covering all kinds of other cases, making a difference out there. I mean, one of the cases that we've helped get publicity is making some good strides out there. And they're just as important, you know. But this one seems pretty crazy and interesting. So you're going to have to take a look at it. All right, so anyways, 1054, victim and Karen Reed enter the waterfall, and then some people said around 11, which is accurate. Then at 12, Nicole Albert leaves the waterfall and is met at her home by her sister, Jennifer McCabe, brother-in-law, Matt McCabe, and her husband. And then, let's see. Ryan, there's a guy named Ryan Na uh, Nagel receives a text from his sister Julie Nagel requesting that he pick her up at Brian Albert Jr.'s house because it was his, it was his birthday party. All right, and then um, let's see 1210 Karen Reed walks out of the waterfall bar with two females. 1211 this is video footage victim walks out of the waterfall bar so just one minute later with sh uh, a short cocktail glass in his right hand meets up with Karen Reed and the two walk together towards Washington Street. Jennifer McCabe leaves the area of the waterfall. And Jennifer McCabe is the sister of the, um, the, the house where the death occurred. And so the, the victim, John, texts Jennifer McCabe, hey, where do we go? You know, so that's the sister of the place of where they're going, right? Like, where, where are we going? You know, where to? And then Jennifer McCabe calls the victim and he answers and they talk for 44 seconds. And it's claimed that that call was deleted from Jennifer McCabe's phone. You know, hey, thanks, B, sir. Then, and then a large black SUV at 1215, consistent with Karen Reed's Lexus, travels on Washington Street and continues toward the Temple Beth Abraham. I mean, I actually mapped some of this out at one point here. I mean, the way that the, I think that they parked somewhere right around in here, and they drove this direction, and you know, in the SUV, and they're looking for the house here. In 1217, they pass the temple here. It doesn't seem to have the same name as they were saying. And then goes to Washington Street right here and then turn, you know, possibly turned right there and then taking a left on Cedar uh, Crest Road would end up, you know, getting there. And there's probably other ways too. You could come in like this, it looks like maybe. Um, but. You know, the straightforward way from there would be to drive like this and then down and take that left right there. And that's the direction apparently she was heading. So I do think she pulled in coming this direction. 
We know that. Ba and ka. <laughs> That's true. A bar and a car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we don't know, Daniel. Do you mind if we just go through the, the notes here? I don't know what you're saying. It just uh, I hadn't brought anything like that up. Yeah, there's some pi there's pictures out there. Yeah. It's on a guy named Turtle Boy's website. Anyway, so here's the uh, Jennifer McCabe calls the victim, answered for 44 seconds. Then there's a large black SUV moving down Washington Street. I just showed you where that was, Temple Beth Abraham. Then Ryan Nagel arrives at 34 Fair, uh, Fairview to pick up Julie Nagel. And that's the girl that called Ryan uh, earlier, if you remember, up above. She called to get a ride home. Yeah, so Nicole Albert and Brian Albert are the individuals who own the home at uh, 34 Fairview right here. Jennifer McCabe is the sister of, uh, man, it's weird. They just, <laughs> the names just aren't popping into my head. It's that Nicole. All right. All right. So then, uh, I was looking at that part with Albra. So Ryan Nagel arrives at 34 Fairview to pick up Julie. Caitlin Albert is picked up by her boyfriend, Tristan Morris. And then at 1217, a large black SUV travels past the Temple Beth Abraham towards the intersection of Washington and Dedham Street in the direction of Fairview Road. Jennifer McCabe arrives at 34 Fairview at 1218. Jennifer McCabe receives a call from John, the victim, and it was answered apparently for 36 seconds. But here's the thing, an answered call is also one that's picked up by voicemail. It's the same thing. It would show the same. But then it says it was deleted from her phone. Then the victim's phone data reflects a call to Jennifer McCabe. Victim's, uh, victim first ping in the neighborhood near 34 Fairview. So John pings in the neighborhood at 1219. That means he's near the house at that point. So this shows that he is in that vehicle. And then the victim arrives at 34 Fairview at 1224. That's when the black SUV pulled up because Karen Reed is driving it. Then at 12.27 a.m., Jennifer McCabe texts the victim and says, are you, like, are you here? But just says, here? And then Jennifer McCabe calls the victim at just two minutes later, and it was answered, but it's only eight seconds. And that could be a voice message. Like it went to voicemail and she listened and then just hung up. But it could, I mean, who knows? I mean, in eight seconds, she could answer, say something, and get off. Victim phones data reflects a call from Jennifer McCabe. So yes, that uh, matches. Then at 12.30, Colin Albert returns home to his parents' residence a few houses down from where the victim lives. Let's see, so Colin Albert returns home to his parents' residence a few houses down from where the victim lives. So I guess uh, somebody named Colin Albert, whose life looks like he might even be, you know, obviously related with the last name of Albert, and he lives some somehow near John uh, O'Keefe. Then at 1231, Jennifer McCabe texts the victim, uh, pull behind me. So Jennifer McCabe is looking outside at the black SUV that Karen Reed owns and, uh, you know, text out there and says, hey, pull behind me because they were out on the street, you know, so she would have to then back up and then go up the driveway. And if you look at it again, so it's from the air right here. Her vehicle is facing this direction and it's right around in here. And then 
from inside the house, uh, Jennifer McCabe texts John, who's inside the vehicle, hey, get behind my car. They want him to park right here in the driveway. Yeah, they're all, they're all, we've all, it's been explained many times. The, na the names of the people are, it's just Jennifer McCabe. Some of these other people are just witnesses, but Jennifer McCabe is really one of the more important ones, obviously. Jennifer McCabe texts the victim, pull behind me. So she's inside the house, says, you know, pull behind me in the driveway. Foot, uh, and then it says 12, 37, 39 footage is missing from Canton Public Library. At the precise time, Karen Reed would have driven past it on the way home after allegedly um, hitting John. Hmm. Then uh, Jennifer McCabe texts the victim, hello. And at 1241, Karen Reed is at the victim's home. Because she, she thought, okay, so I mean, it's sort of interesting, right? Like, if you just look at the time frame right here, at 1224, she's right in front of 34 Fairview. And then just literally 17 minutes later, she's back home. That sounds like she just dropped him off and went home. Now, Karen Reed is at the victim's home. This is option, well, it says option eight. Footage is, uh, leaves a voicemail for the victim and you hear the garage door closing car door closing, house door closing, while she walked in her high heels in the garage floor. So they have a voicemail from at 1241 where Karen Reed is at the victim's home, leaves a voicemail for him, and leaves a voice message for John O'Keefe right after she gets back over to his house, but she lives there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, there really isn't. I, 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 I was thinking of doing a flow chart, but it's just, it's almost too many people, and it wouldn't help you guys really, because you'd want me to go back to the the chart every three seconds, and uh, but just re all there really the main one is Jennifer McCabe and the Alberts, and then there's witnesses, etc. Well, I don't have a flow chart, you guys. There, you'd have to put 30 pictures on it, and it doesn't work like uh, the other case. Huh? I don't know what you mean. We could just print it out. What, what are you talking about? Jennifer McCabe observes the black SUV pull away and leave. That's at 1245. Well, that's kind of weird because at 1241, if Karen Reed's already home, uh, let me, let me, how does that work? So Karen Reed is at the victim's home, leaves a voicemail for the victim, and you hear the garage door closing, car door closing, house door closing while she walked in her high heels. And at 1241, Jennifer McCabe calls John, deleted. 1242 uh, basically calls, deleted. And then 1243, Jennifer McCabe calls the victim. Uh, again, he doesn't answer. And then a text message. Jennifer McCabe texts the victim, hello, at 1245. And. Hmm. I don't really understand how you're still seeing the... When do they see the car back up? Because I remember them saying that.
Denver Cave, there, see, look at it. Now we're at 1245. She observes the black SUV pull away and leave. I mean, so how, how does that work if at 1241 she's already at, at John O'Keefe's home on a, making a phone call? Right? And then at 1245, she's looking at the SUV pull away. And but that's from an interview statement. So I guess that, you know. Maybe she just it was twelve forty and she's saying twelve forty five. Who who knows? And then Jennifer this is now twelve forty six, Jennifer McCabe calls the victim and then deleted it. Forty seven, called the victim, then deleted it. Uh, then Jennifer calls the victim and you know, these are all unanswered and then she deleted it. So, you know, he's not answering his phone here. It doesn't even go to voicemail either. And then at one o'clock, all guests leave the Albert residence at 34 Fairview. Then at 1.30, Brian Higgs leaves 34 Fairview and goes to the Canton Police Department to complete administrative work. So obviously he works for the police department too. Jennifer and Matthew McCabe leave, and so that's, both, that's the sister of the homeowner. She's the one that's been trying to get a hold of John O'Keefe so many times. It must have been weird, uh, you know, let's just say there isn't anything nefarious, and you know, you see the SUV sitting there, and you're texting the person, and then all of a sudden they never show up. And you're wondering, I mean, that could explain why you're texting but then deleting it, I'm not sure why you're deleting these phone calls and text messages. It's kind of weird. Hey, thanks, Mrs. C. Mm -hmm. Then it's uh, Brian Higgins leaves 34 Fairview. Jennifer McCabe leaves 34 Fairview at 147. Jennifer turns right on Lawrence Street. Jennifer McCabe is on Leonard Way, and her course is reversed. And then 12.12, Jennifer McCabe arrives at her residence. 12.15, Brian Lofren arrives at the barn to get in his dump truck and begin plowing. Okay, so this is the guy. This uh, Brian Lucky Lofren is the snow plower because it's really snowing hard at this point. And then Jennifer McCabe sends a text message at 1225. 1225, she sends a text message again. Then at 12, uh, excuse me, 225. This is 225. 215 in the morning. That's when Brian uh, Lofren, the plower, is going to be going around. And then 225 in that same minute. Jennifer sends a text message. Now, though, I don't know why it doesn't say to who here. And then at 2.26, Jennifer deletes two screenshots. So I don't know, even know what that means, really. But then, this is like the key moment in the case for a lot of people. Apparently, this is the moment where the public got more interested in it. Is Jennifer McCabe, based on the... You know, the cell phone, Celebrite information. She does an internet search for, you know, it says HOS, H-O-S, but if you look where the S and the W are on your keyboard, it's really close. So it says, how long to die in the cold? And this is at 227. And then Brian Lofren at 230 sees a Ford Edge parked in front of 34 Riverview, uh, Riverview or Fairview Road towards the end of the property facing Chapman. The vehicle remained there at least an hour. Now, so he's seeing a Ford Edge parked in front of the 34 Fairview Road towards the left of the property, which is interesting because at that exact uh, time, 2.30 to 3 o'clock in the morning, that is likely when, you know, John O'Keefe, if Karen Reed ran over her is right there. So whoever owns the Ford Edge seemingly has some kind of connection to that either because that's where he's found, right? That's where John O'Keefe was found. If you go to the map here, 
It's right here. Go down the street view, turn. This is the flagpole. This is the electrical panel or whatever it is that was broken. Uh, he was found like right in here, right in this area on the grass. And this is the left part of the property. And apparently there was a vehicle parked here, like between 2.30 and 3. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Thank you, WNC Granny. How you doing, WNC Granny? And hello, everybody, to Danielle, Kubi, 8675309, Elaine, Brenda Redman, CJ, Jarhead Jane, Paulette Leonard, Jessica Schubach, this account, Ariel, and Zozo and Paulette Leonard and Allie Cake. Hmm. So no, that's a little bit weird, right? Like, uh, why is there this other car parked exactly where John O'Keefe's body was? Apparently, if you believe that Karen. Reed ran over him. He's sitting right there. Or does the car at 2.30 or 3 have something to do with it? No, well, she went the other direction, so she turned around. And I think it was just uh, like if he if, he, if she did something to him intentionally, he would be he would get out of the passenger side. So again, look at it from the top. We went over this whole thing last night, you know. So if you missed last night, you're just not gonna you're just not gonna get it. So if she did it intentionally, she was driving this direction right here, right? And then he gets out of the car. Let's say they were arguing, and then he then he walks this direction, and she's pissed off. All she had to do was back over him, boom, like that, and then head off this direction again. So he would just back over him, run into him, and then go that direction away. And that would end up being the correct location of where, which taillight was injured, or hurt too, right? So if it backs up right here and he's standing here, the right rear taillight would hit him. Uh, you know, like he's standing right here. She pulls up and then guns it backwards and then goes that way again. I'm just saying. What car? What, what, I'm not sure what you're talking about, Zozo. Her black car left. This car was just one that they said was there for an hour. So anyways, uh, then it, so it was 2.30 to 3 a.m. The Brian Lucky Lawfren sees a Ford Edge parked in front of 34 Fairview Road towards the left of the property facing Chapman. The vehicle remained there at least an hour. And then at 4.30, the victim's niece is woken up by Karen Reed. So now we're... You know, she got home at, what was that? They say 12, based on the 1241. So four hours later, uh, the niece of John O'Keefe is woken up. He, he adopted both his uh, nephew and niece because I think their parents died or something like that. And so the niece is woken up. And then 23 minutes later, Karen Reed and the victim's niece called Jennifer McCabe distraught because the victim had not come home yet. You know, and I don't know why you'd be distraught right away. Wouldn't you just start making calls to, you know, you're the one that has the car, so you could check to see, hey, is he did he pass out on your couch or something? So I'm not sure why you'd be distraught already at 458 or 453. You know what I mean? Like, it just feels like, 
you know, you left him at a party and, you know, this is already 12 something and four in the morning wouldn't be crazy. And then 459, Jennifer McCabe calls the victim unanswered. So again, I mean, it's w weird because Jennifer Reed and the victim's niece, they call Jennifer McCabe because they were distraught. And then right after they hung up the phone, Jennifer McCabe then calls John O'Keefe and it goes unanswered. And she deleted that one. And then at 5 a.m., uh, Carrie Roberts receives a call from Karen Reed stating that John didn't come home. And I think that's just one of her friends. Didn't come home. It was snowing and she was worried. Karen Reed stated her, uh, her John's dead. <laughs> so uh, Karen Reed told Carrie, man, John's dead. Uh, Carrie, I wonder if he's dead. It's snowing. He got hit by a plow, maybe. Something like that. Jennifer McCabe calls the victim again at 504 and it goes unanswered. Then Karen Reed calls Jennifer McCabe again at 505, and that one goes unanswered, probably because she's on the phone dialing um, John at that moment. And then 505, Jennifer McCabe calls Karen Reed, and then it's answered, and they speak for 43 seconds. And then at 507, there's video footage of Karen Reed's vehicle backs out of the victim's garage and it's claimed that it strikes the victim's parked Chevrolet Traverse. I've seen the video. It's hard to tell if it even, it gets right there, but uh, you don't really see the car moving very, at all. I can't see it. You know, like I literally sat there and looked at it over and over and it, you just can't tell. Uh, if you want to see it move, you can definitely see it move though. Yeah, uh, let's see. So it backs out of the victim's garage, striking the victim's parked Chevrolet Traverse. Karen Reed's SUV leaves the garage door, uh, let's see, leaves the right garage door, that uh, might mean open, leaves the right garage door, travels out of the driveway and onto the Meadows Avenue and turning left on the Pleasant Street. Jennifer McCabe calls John O'Keefe again at 5.08. And she calls him again at 5.09. Kind of makes you, I mean, some some ways it almost seems like Jennifer McCabe was interested in um, John O'Keefe. You know, like he, she was literally, like, doesn't it seem strange? <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. I think what uh, Zozo just typed in there. I think it, in some ways, because remember she's the one that said, if we go back, let's see, where are we at? We're at if you go up to the top here John O'Keefe walks to CF okay but Julie Albert is I think isn't that uh, so Julie Albert is yeah now I, I gotta remember and her sister Julie so that's one of Nicole Albert's sisters Jennifer and Julie are Nicole Albert's sisters but they're saying, hey, get, get down here to John. Seems like they're pretty close with him. Yeah, none of the stuff, we don't even know what that means when it says deleted, you know. Um, is it intentionally deleted? Did she look at it and go, ooh, wow, and then hit a, a delete button? Don't know. Jennifer McCabe calls, uh, let's see, where are we at here? Karen Reed calls Jennifer McCabe at 519. No, I think we're higher up here. Like, uh, let's see, large SUV travels down Sherman Street, takes a left on Washington and travels in the direction of the waterfall. That's at 511, so that's going to be Karen Reed. And then 514, Jennifer... McCabe calls the victim and it goes unanswered. Then 515, a large black SUV travels away from the area of waterfall on Washington Street, comes over Sherman and continues on Washington towards Temple Beth Abraham. 
Then 516, Karen Reed calls Jennifer McCabe. So Karen Reed then again calls Jennifer McCabe, one of John's friends, and they talked for almost three minutes here. And that call was deleted, whatever that means. I mean, I don't think it is anybody that stupid these days that they don't think that your phone records show if you just delete it off your phone. I mean, Karen Reed calls Jennifer McCabe and they talk for 24 seconds at 519. And then Jennifer McCabe calls the victim again and it goes unanswered. Then Jennifer calls Karen Reed and they talk for 95 seconds. Then Jennifer McCabe calls the victim again, it goes unanswered. Then Jennifer McCabe calls Karen Reed and they talk for another 64 seconds. And then Jennifer McCabe calls Tom Beatty and it goes unanswered, deleted. These are all deleted, these calls here. Jennifer McCabe leaves her residence at 539. And then Carrie Roberts, one of Karen Reed's friends, follows behind Karen Reed's black Lexus SUV leaves her resident. Jennifer McCabe calls Tom. Let's see. Okay, so Jennifer McCabe leaves her residence. And then uh, Carrie Roberts follows behind Karen Reed's black Lexus SUV. Karen, uh, Jennifer McCabe arrives at the victim's residence. Jennifer McCabe calls the victim. And then Jennifer McCabe calls Tom uh, Beatty again. And then Jennifer McCabe leaves the victim's residence. Jennifer McCabe is, uh, pro is in the proximity of the waterfall bar and grill. Jennifer McCabe calls Tom Beatty again. Answered two seconds deleted from Jennifer McCabe's phone. Jennifer McCabe arrives at 34 Fairview at, this is 6.03 in the morning. It seems like this is different than I read in some of these reports because I heard that um, Jennifer McCabe arrived at the house of John O'Keefe and then she drove um, Karen because Karen was too distraught. And so inside that vehicle is Karen, um, Jennifer, and... Uh, let's see, Karen, Jennifer, and the other friend, Ka uh, Carrie. So Carrie, Jennifer, and Karen were all in that car. So that's a little different, you know. So this, this document here is sort of putting it in a way that, um, you know, it's sort of leaving out things that are, you know, I mean, I get what you're, you're trying to say because you're just basing it on a cell phone, but why not? You know, I mean, they said that they were with her, right? Jennifer McCabe calls 911, answered three minutes, 32 seconds. No, wait, let me go back up. Jennifer McCabe arrives at 34 Fairview. 603, Jennifer McCabe calls 911. So you're leaving out the part where they were, they were all there and... Um, they arrive together and how Karen, um, Karen Reed looks at her car and sees the body there and everyone else was, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Like she knew exactly where John O'Keefe was going to be. So this is, this right here is leaving out that information. And it might be because it can't be proven. It was just what two people said. Officer Seraph is the first officer to arrive on the scene where he observes three females waving at him uh, from the front yard area of the residence. This is Karen Reed, Jennifer McCabe, and Carrie Roberts. Right, so Karen Reed, Jennifer McCabe, and Carrie Roberts are all in the front portion of the yard right next to the flagpole. And they all arrive together in the black SUV. So what they're doing is they're leaving out that part and, uh, so, and just using her cell phone information. So you're left sort of, oh, so they were driving alone. And, and you know that part up here where it said, uh, what was it? Carrie Roberts follows behind Karen Reed's black Lexus SUV. 
Well, the weird part is, is this right here where it says phone location data. Jennifer McCabe arrives at the victim's residence. And then in this interview statement, Carrie Roberts follows behind Karen. This is this right here doesn't even have a time and needs to be placed after this. You see what I'm saying? Like the Carrie Roberts follows behind Karen Reed's black Lexus SUV. And right here it says Jer McCabe, Jer uh, Jennifer McCabe arrives at the victim's residence. And let's see. <laughs> yeah, see, they're just leaving it all out, out of there. It's crazy. So right here, this portion here needs to be after this because Jennifer McCabe arrives at the victim's residence. Carrie Roberts follows behind Karen Reed's black Lexus SUV because, I, if I remember correctly, Jennifer McCabe is driving the black Lexus SUV. And I think Carrie is in the passenger front seat and Jennifer and um, Karen Reed is in the back seat. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I mean, isn't that weird? How come this is not in there like that? This makes it sound totally illogical and confusing. Oh, wow. So Carrie Roberts follows behind Karen Reed, black SUV. Where? How? How? Karen Reed is already in, she's in the house at this point. You see, like she's been at home here. They had the uh, niece call. You remember that part? They had the niece call and, um, she called Jennifer McCabe and then Jennifer is calling different people and then she ends up going over to his house. It even says right here where Jennifer McCabe arrives at John O'Keefe's residence and it says 546, but it says phone location data. And then it says right here, Jennifer leaves her residence at 539. But then right here it says, um, Carrie Roberts follows behind Karen Reed's black SUV, Lexus SUV, where? That's not mentioned anywhere, you know? I mean, didn't, does she go back home at 518 or like, okay, because right here, the large SUV travels by the front of Temple Beth Abraham. Karen Reed calls Jennifer McCabe. And, you know, do we know that if Karen made it back to her house because it said in there that they all made it they were at her residence and that Karen Reed was too distraught and so Jennifer McCabe drove and Carrie Roberts was in the front seat and Karen Reed was in the back seat and they drove to the um, 34 Fairview address if you guys remember this and when they got there they drove by some trees and almost immediately Karen says, oh, there he is right there. And they were, they were confused, it said, because they couldn't see anything. It was, a, it was totally blurry with the snow, etc. Mm -hmm. Huh? What are, you, what are you talking about? It, it, it was absolutely, it was in the interviews, so it should be in there, CE. Yeah, it was in the interviews, and all, all this stuff over here, it was in these interviews up here, right? So why would you cherry pick, uh, like, the interview with Nicole Albert, the interview with Brian Albert, uh, that longer, the Commonwealth Memorandum, it has all that in, in there. It's all listed right over here. So why wouldn't you mention that stuff? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go back over to the uh, that document we were reading last night. I think it's the Commonwealth Memorandum, if I remember correctly. But hey, you guys, if you're out there and you want to help support the Gray Hughes Investigates YouTube channel, I would appreciate it. Goes to help supporting 
me and my channel and all the great stuff we do each month. So I think we're on page uh, 21 or something here. So now it gets kind of interesting down here because they start interviewing the niece and nephew. Okay, so right here. On February 22nd, both the 10-year-old nephew, CF, and the 14-year-old niece, KF, of the, um, of the victim were interviewed at the Norfolk Advocates for Children's Center in Foxborough, Massachusetts. The children indicated they had lived with their uncle, the victim, for approximately eight years following the passing of both their parents. I mean, what a nightmare that is. Both children indicated that the victim and the defendant had started dating approximately two years ago. After having dated some some time before in the distant past, right? Like they dated and maybe let's just pretend like let's just say it was in high school and then years later they ran into each other again. They both indicated that the defendant would stay over their house on Meadows Avenue several nights a week. P.F. stated that the defendant and the victim argued a decent amount of time. P.F. recalled a recent argument over groceries and that John O'Keefe expressing needing a break from the defendant. After that particular argument, John O'Keefe wanted the defendant to leave their house. However, she refused. PF indicated that she had left the home on January 28th at approximately 8 p.m. So this is the night, you know, the just before she gets over to Let's see, what the hell is the name of that place again? Now, see if McCarthy's over here. Uh, leave their house however she refused and then says at approximately 8 p.m. she left the house and that was on the 28th oh wait maybe it was he left so it says pf indicated that he le had left the home on january 28th at 8 p.m. for a sleepover at a friend's house and was not present at the home overnight pf indicated that neither he nor his sister had access to the ring system, but believed that the defendant did from the family computer within the home. KF indicated uh, during her interview that the defendant and the victim had argued a lot towards the end, approximately two to three times a week. She further stated that approximately a week prior to January 29th, she was sitting on the stairway inside the house while the victim and the defendant were arguing. KF stated uh, that she heard the victim tell the defendant that their relationship had run its course and that it isn't healthy. She stated that the defendant did not want the relationship to end and refused to leave their house. I mean, it's almost, almost like Jody Arias. You know, that's the kind of shit she would do. Stated that she had gone to bed at approximately 11 p.m on January 28th after her friend had left so KF stated that she had gone to bed this is the niece I think at approximately 11 p.m. on January 28th after her friend had left and was awoken by the defendant at around 430 because remember she had her um, call McCabe And so it was 4.30 a.m. with the defendant screaming and acting frantic. It's almost like she knew something had happened. The defendant ran into the victim's bedroom to retrieve KF's cell phone, and KF then began texting and calling the victim with no response. The defendant then had KF call Miss McCabe and put the defendant on the phone with her. Oh, so she thought that 
John was going to be with Gen Jennifer McCabe. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Huh. So the defendant ran into the victim's bedroom to retreat. So this is sort of like the uh, 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 K uh, Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan calling Jack's phone because they think maybe uh, he would answer if Madison called, right, instead of Kaylee. So right here, you have the defendant ran into the victim's bedroom to retrieve her phone, like KF's phone, the niece's phone, and KF then began texting and calling the victim with no response. So it's like, hey, hey, why don't you text? Maybe you'll answer if you do it. I, I don't know where he is. I don't know where he is. And so she kept texting her dad, basically, with no response. The defendant then had the, the niece call Miss McCabe and then put the defendant on the phone with her. Like, hey, put him on the phone. He's not answering anybody. After speaking with Miss McCabe, the defendant left the house and told KF to call Mr. Camerano. Let's see. After speaking with Miss McCabe, the defendant left the house and told KF to call Mr. Camerano. So her niece, so hey niece, call Mr. Camerano to come and pick her up. The niece indicated during her interview that um, Karen changed her story several times while speaking to Miss McCabe on the phone with initially the defendant stating that she and the victim got into an argument and she dropped him off. Hmm. That she got uh, got into an argument and she dropped him off. Now, see, I actually believe that that's a possibility that they got in an argument. And he got out of the car. On January 29th, the trooper also recovered Mr. O'Keefe's cell phone, and were subsequently able to forensically extract the data from said phone. Their forensic extraction of the call logs, voicemails, and text messages between the victim and the defendant, including the date of January 28th through the 29th, uh, detailed strain, uh, let's see, strains within the relationship. So they went through all their text messages and they weren't getting along at all. So a lot of this stuff is classic here, right? Like this is the victim's desire to end the relationship and the defendant's description of the relationship with them and the two children together as toxic. The trooper, the troopers recovered uh, several voicemails from the victim's phone from the defendant following the time period. They were in front of the residence at 34 Fairview in which the defendant screamed to the victim that she hated him. So that means during the time that they were sitting there, um, I mean, not really, this part's confusing to me. The troopers recovered several voicemails from the victim's phone from the defendant following the, the time, so after the time period they were in front of the residence. So that means after her SUV probably took off, she had, there's several voicemails on there where she just screamed to the victim and she said that she hated him. On January 29th, the defendant was transported from the scene to the Good Samaritan Medical Center. While there, blood was drawn pursuant to her medical diagnosis and treatment at the facility. The ethanol results from said records indicate that at 9.08 a.m. on the 29th, her blood had a reading of 93 mg, uh, mg. Nicholas Roberts, a forensic uh, tax, uh, toxicologist from Massachusetts State's uh, State uh, Police Crime Lab. Let's see. I guess that means it's about like 0.07 to 0.08. However, that was many hours later. So they said that had she been tested prior, if she'd been at least 0.13 to 0.29, which is you know wasted, which max matches the number of vodka shots she seemed to be having. I mean, she had seven in like an hour and a half at that bar. 
Lastly, these facts are summarized from a grand jury presentation that spans several months with at least 14 dates of testimony from approximately 42 witnesses and 1,445 pages of grand jury uh, transcripts of sworn testimony from said witnesses. Oh, hey, thanks, uh, Kelly, for the PayPal. Appreciate it. Very kind, very kind. Lastly, these facts are summarized from a grand jury presentation that spans several months. When a defendant moves, let me just skip through this legal jargon stuff here. Uh, so she's looking for the time period the defendant is requesting access is unclear. On the first page of the defendant's motion, she requests all cell phone in the possession of and used by Brian Albert between January 28th and present. Later in the same motion, the defendant requests information from the phone from January 28th through February 5th. The defendant requests for such unfettered access without any evidence of uh, materiality of said content is, is without support. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's kind of weird because it's like their theory is that everybody at the party did it. Their bail was small. Here, uh, I mean, I think there's a possibility in this case that because John Robert or John O'Keefe was a uh, police officer and most of probably all of his friends knew that he didn't really like Jennifer or Karen Reed anymore. He was like, yeah. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. And let's say in a non-nefarious situation, Karen Reed sort of, you know, I don't I don't know. Like she just they were fighting and she backed over him. And they've turned it into something way bigger. I mean, it, it's horrible anyways, regardless, but it could be something that was turned way bigger by a conspiracy sort of in a small group of people. Right? But uh, Karen Reed's defense is that at that party, that's where everybody was doing, um, you know, those are the people responsible for his death. And in, specifically, they believe that he was beaten up and then the homeowner's dog attacked him, giving him those scratches and... Uh, you know, to the credit of the defense team, the homeowner got rid of that dog just like three or four months later because it was a, a violent dog that had already attacked somebody else before. Now, did they come up with this theory after realizing that the dog was like that? I mean, it'd be interesting to know, like, after, was it like the homeowner, he gets rid of the dog and then they went, ooh, what was wrong? Ooh, yeah, let's add that in there, too. Mm -hmm. The defendant stated a lot of things to a lot of witnesses and a trooper in the interview with them. However, the version that the defendant has consistently maintained is one of First impression, the defendant seems to suggest that the body of Mr. O'Keefe was discovered that morning by the defendant and Miss McCabe. However, Miss Roberts was present with them at this time as well, but uh, remains absent from counsel. Uh, recitation of the facts. Counsel further states that Miss McCabe inserted herself into the, into the defendant's search that morning for Mr. O'Keefe. However, it was the defendant that awoke the victim's niece at 4:30 a.m. Had the niece repeatedly had their niece repeatedly text and call the victim and then asked or instructed the niece to call Miss McCabe at 4:53 a.m. 
Ms. McCabe answered this call from the victim, victim's niece, not the defendant. During this call, the defendant stated to Ms. McCabe initially that she last remembered seeing the victim at the waterfall. When informed by Ms. McCabe that she had seen the victim and the defendant leave the waterfall together and seen the defendant's vehicle in front of the Fairview residence, the defendant then stated that she had left the victim on Fairview after they had gotten into an argument. So, like Karen Reed herself admits to leaving John O'Keefe right there on the property. Nobody in the house says that he went into the house. Okay, now that's where the conspiracy would be, is the few people remaining at the house. He literally came in, but why did they beat him up? Has anybody come up with a reason why um, John O'Keefe was beaten up? Like, what was the motive there for that? Who was angry at him? Now, we said that already, Kubi, earlier in the show. And so maybe that pissed off her husband. There, we don't know when the trial is going to be. They're putting off the trial now because of the federal investigation. But you guys, currently right now we're at 25% of a goal, okay, the normal goal that we have. And I know it's, uh, you know, it's like every single night on the channel I try to raise the funds on here to help support the channel, etc. And I know it probably just falls on deaf ears a lot. You hear it and you're like, yeah, 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 you said that last night. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, you know, if you're out there and you're able to help support the channel in that way, that'd be great. But this is one of those uh, struggling nights after missing three full days um, on a trip. Mm -hmm. Yep, the, uh, the blue code or whatever you call it. All right, so they got in a fight, at a, and he dies, and then somehow the dog bit him, and they, then they just they looked at the surveillance footage and went, "Wow, look at that! Karen Reed was over by that light, uh, that pole. Let's put his body over there because we can make it look like that that's what he she did over there." I don't know. That just seems like a lot of extra thinking. Uh, but I think that the there's a lot of it, the, the absolutely overcharging here like it just feels like um, I think what I mean I don't know what this federal investigation is going to bring back it'd be really interesting if it came back with that there is a cover up and there was something else that happened well thanks Peggy oh, thanks Kathy Chapin and Paulette Leonard I mean, I could put this up on the... Uh, now, that was from yesterday. <laughs> Combining uh, yesterday and today's in the, in the one. Uh, I can't hear, hear what they find out. Yeah, I mean, Karen Reed sounds like the best suspect um, you know that night they were everybody was getting along I mean wouldn't let me ask you this though if it, if it if it was something I guess it was prior well here's the thing is they were all interviewed after his body was found right um, all of the different uh, elements here the uh, people like uh, you know Jennifer McCabe and 
um, the Alberts, all those people were interviewed later and they said, wow, they were all just getting along so well. They were just getting along so well and everything. There was no arguments, nothing. Why wouldn't they have put that in there? I mean, what an easy thing to say, because all of them probably knew that they, were, they didn't get along all the time. Couldn't they have just said, oh man, she was so pissed off. I mean, when they stormed away, I heard her say something. and Yeah, it was, it didn't look good. And then she's dead, and then he's found dead, and then it seems like that would make sense, and then it matches what the kids say and everything. But they didn't say that at all. So why didn't they include that in their cover-up story? Instead of, wow, they were just getting along great. So it doesn't make sense that all of a sudden she would uh, kill him, right? Thank you, Timothy Cecil and Paulette Leonard and Kathy Chapin. Right, she is suspicious, <laughs> you know. But you ha you can't ignore, though, the fact that for a long time, the Justice Department and another agency, if I remember correct, ha have been looking in to the investigation of this case. So that's weird, right? That makes it more interesting that there's something to some of the claims that people make. Yeah. There we go. So just so the trolls know the reality of it. See right there, you can see that's where we're at right there, 86.93. And I just switched that over to on here so it has the same number in there. All right. Uh, it, that chant, the Streamlab just keeps track of, like you can set it for four days in the future and it keeps track of days. So right now we're at 86.93, we're at an hour and 20 minutes in. Unless you were there, you don't know anything. Yeah, well, nobody knows anything. <laughs> uh, but it is, there is a big conspiracy here, I can tell you that. I think one of the biggest ones right here is that at um, 227, Jennifer McCabe does an inter internet search for how long to die in cold? Why would she do that? Why would she put that in there? Uh, way before. I mean, and by the way, why is she still awake here? You know, like uh, everybody had left by one o'clock. And why is Jennifer McCabe still um, out and about? So right here, she leaves 34 Fairview, hour and 47 minutes later. Um, and then she arrives at her home at 12.12. And then she sends a text message, uh, two of them. And then at 2.27, how long to die in the cold? Almost as if she'd seen him laying there, right? Yeah, but she doesn't know. You, you guys are, you're not really getting the point here. So when you say because she's jealous, that doesn't make any sense. Or um, infidelity. Yeah, I mean, we've all thought that there was infidelity between her and, you know, like that was a, it was a thought that there was infidelity between her and John. But what, what I'm trying to get you to see is like, why is she searching 
for how long to die in the cold when she doesn't even find out until almost six in the morning that John is dead right by the flagpole there. Mm -hmm. No, we don't, we don't know if she did, Paulette. <laughs> and that's the thing. We don't know if she did. But she is an interesting person because of how involved she seems to be. I mean, she's still up at 227 and does that internet search, apparently. And then 504, she's calling the victim. Why is she, uh, let's see. Karen Reed and the victim's niece called Jennifer. So that's at 453. Okay, so they're the ones that woke her up again. Thanks, Allie Cake, for the wave attempt. Will it happen? I appreciate it. I appreciate your attempt there. Just trying to get back on track for the month here. Uh, let's see. Miss McCabe answers this call. That was a 453 call from the niece. Uh, not the defendant. During this call, the defendant stated to Miss McCabe initially that she last remembered seeing the victim at the waterfall. When informed by Miss McCabe that she had seen the victim and the defendant leaving the waterfall together and seeing the defendant's vehicle in front of the Fairview residence, the defendant then stated that she had left the victim on Fairview after they had gotten into an argument. The statements made by the defendant to Miss McCabe during this call were confirmed by the victim's niece in her interview. The defendant then drove from the victim's home to Miss okay, the defendant then drove from the victim's home to Miss McCabe's home, exiting the garage at 5:08 p.m. per the victim. Uh, ring camera. Maybe maybe uh, it's from Miss McCabe's home that, I don't know, let's see. Uh, however, uh, let's see, ring camera footage said, said ring footage, however, does not contain any video of the defendant arrival to the victim's home after she left Fairview residence. The defendant arrived at the home of Miss McCabe at approximately 5.30, shortly following, followed by Miss Roberts. Okay, so that sort of doesn't match what we were looking at. Let, let me go back up to that. There it is. Karen Reed's vehicle backs out of the garage, leaves. All right, Jennifer McCabe calls the victim. A large black SUV travels down Sherman. Jennifer McCabe calls the victim. And 515, large black SUV travels from the waterfall. 516, Karen Reed calls Jennifer McCabe. 518, another black SUV driving by the Temple Beth Abraham. 519, Karen Reed calls Jennifer McCabe. Jennifer, and then 520, what time was that again? So five, Miss McCabe at 5.30 a.m. The defendant arrived. Okay, so let's get to that point. So Jennifer McCabe calls Karen, and 531, Jennifer McCabe calls the victim. But I mean, right now, she's over at the, <laughs> Miss McCabe is at, um, I mean, Karen is at Miss McCabe's house at 530. And, and she was being followed by Miss Roberts. We see the followed part here. There goes my stomach. Where is it? Five. Yeah. So right here, uh, interview Karen Roberts followed behind Karen Reed's black Lexus SUV. Okay. But it says right here, Jennifer McCabe leaves her residence. Ah, man. So definitely some crazy stuff going on right there.
The defendant arrived at the home of Miss McCabe at approximately 5.30 a.m., shortly followed by Miss Roberts, whom the defendant had also called that morning and provided a different story as to the victim's whereabouts than what she had earlier stated to Miss McCabe. The video from the Canton Town Library in the Temple, coupled with the movements of the defendant's cellular phone, detail that prior to going to Miss McCabe's home, the defendant went in both the direction of the waterfall and the residence on Fairview. Uh, Fairview. Counsel suggests that Miss McCabe delayed the defendant's return to the Fairview residence that morning when the evidence demonstrates that she had already been there before she even went to Miss McCabe's home. This case is simply not a counsel, uh, as counsel misconstrues solely a wholly reliant on the testimony of Miss McCabe. Thanks, Peter. Mm, another attempt at a wave. Will that one happen? Counsel for the defendant states that the victim's injuries demonstrates that he was beaten severely and left for dead. This is what the def defense wants. The victim's medical records belie this character uh, characterization of his injuries. The medical records from Good Samaritan characterize the victim's injuries as right superior orbital ridge region, approximately seven millimeter laceration, plus surrounding soft tissue, swelling, contusion, plus breath sounds, bilaterally, pulseless, superficial abrasions, right forearm. Dr. Scordy Bello testified before the grand jury at length regarding the victim's injuries. The doctor described Mr. O'Keefe's right arm injuries as scratches caused by a blunt object. The doctor noted that they appeared in linear pattern. The doctor detailed that she observed no signs of an altercation or fight from her examination of Mr. O'Keefe. Lastly, she testified in great detail as to the swelling of his eyes uh, being uh, related to the fractures in his skull and how those manifested into the observable swelling and discoloration of his face. There are no conflicting accounts of the victim's existing or exiting there are no conflicting accounts of the victim exiting the defendant's vehicle and entering the residence, right? So there's nobody out there that says he enters the residence. Now, that's where you'd have to have everybody in the house do a cover-up. Mr. Nagel's testimony does not demonstrate what counsel suggests. Mr. Nagel, so Nagel's the, uh, the person that picked up his sister, just some uh, random, so his sister was at a birthday party for the homeowner's kid. Mr. Nagel did not say that there was not a passenger in the defendant's vehicle. He stated merely that as he drove past the vehicle, he only saw the female operator. Mr. Nagel also testified that the vehicle he was a passenger within and the defendant's vehicle arrived on Fairview at the same time, pulling up to the curb in front of the residence in tandem. Mr. Nagel further stated that at no time did he see the defendant's vehicle without its brake lights illuminated, never saw uh, anyone exit the vehicle, let alone an, um, enter the home, saw no footprints around the vehicle nor anyone outside of it, never observed any damage to the defendant's vehicle, and never lost sight of the vehicle from the time it pulled on to the street until the time he left his friend's truck, left in his friend's truck. Mr. Nagel's statements do not substantiate that the victim entered the home, but rather point more to um, events that neither the victim nor anyone else had yet exited the defendant's vehicle while Mr. Nagel was in front of the home. All parties within the residence, as well as Mr. Nagel, are consistent in that they never observed anyone exit the vehicle or come into the residence. 
the defendant is still present in her vehicle in front of Mr. Uh, in front of the residence when Mr. Nagel leaves. Therefore, he cannot account for anything the defendant did in front of the house. Yeah, I mean, she wouldn't do something like if she intentionally ran over him, would she really do that while there was another car with its lights on right behind you? Probably not. Counsel also refers to Trooper Proctor as a close family friend of both the McCabe's and the Alberts. He's not. The photograph that uh, counsel attached to this motion and several preceding motions said to depict the trooper with one of the McCabe's children is simply not accurate. The McCabe's have four daughters. The juvenile female depicted in one of them the young child is related to Trooper Proctor and of no relation to the McCabe's. Counsel also describes the precipitation at 6.04 a.m. on January 29th as minimal. See, that's one of the things that spread around a lot is that, hey, there was hardly any snowfall at all. Um, the Canton police cruiser camera footage uh, of Officer Saris Cruiser that morning, as well as the statement and testimony of numerous witnesses uh, present that morning are in direct contradiction to that. All of the things that counsel states Miss McCabe did to set the narrative are corroborated by other witnesses or video or both. As a as aforementioned, the current motion states little, if anything, in the facts as it relates to Mr. Albert. The motion spends a great deal of time attempting to discredit Miss McCabe. Uh, as it pertains to Miss McCabe, the defendant uh, avers that new revelations have been discovered by their expert, Mr. Richard Green, from his analysis of Miss McCabe's phone. So this is that time uh, that were previously withheld from the defense. Mr. Green's analysis, however, much like the facts section of counsel motion, is, is either incorrect or incomplete in its details of the evidence. Similarly, too, if taken, divorced from the context of the entirety of the evidence, it too can easily be misconstrued. The Commonwealth did not withhold the information from the defense. When the defense requested the raw extracted data from the Commonwealth, it was timely provided. As detailed in Trooper Nicholas Garino's report, the Commonwealth ran Miss, uh, let's see, Commonwealth ran Miss McCabe's phone through Celebrite UFED reader that was created on May 4th, 2022, the defense expert used Celebrite Physical Analyzer version 7.61.0.12, a newer updated version of the software utilized to download said material. The purportedly incriminating search in question does not appear in the downloaded material using the earlier version of the software and was therefore not in the earlier extraction. So you're explaining why it, you know, it's there, it's real, but you just didn't have it in your extraction because you used a previous version. So you're explaining how it wasn't really withheld. Your previous version of Celebrite just didn't pull it. So, I mean, currently reading this, it's helping the defense here not in the early extraction. The updated version of Celebrite that was not in existence at the time of the trooper's initial download does show such a search. However, the Google search, ho, uh, HOS, you know, hose long to die in cold, meaning, you know, how long to die in cold, did not occur at 2.27.40 a.m. is what it's saying here. So this is where they're trying to uh, really, you know, dispute that time because that really matters a lot. Like if she searched that, 
if McCabe did that search at 227, then there's something else going on in this case, right? The file was parsed from a write ahead log. A WA file is a file that a you know, SQLite database creates to temporarily store data prior to being written into the database. WA files can contain multiple copies of the same page, each with different data records. An iPhone user would not be able to access the WAL file through the phone to purposely delete entity or entries placed there. Let's see. An iPhone user would not be able to access the WA file through the phone to purposely delete entries placed there as counsel purports. Miss McCabe uh, as as they purports Miss McCabe did here. In addition, at this at exact same time at 22740, there is a search location in the Knowledge C database for um, HTTP ozonebasketball.com teams. This timestamp is at least is in the last extraction of the Safari tab in the iPhone to search the Ozone Basketball website at 2.27.40 a.m. and not a search of hose long to die in coal. This would have been purged from the WAL file once the tab was closed because, I mean, I, I mean, you know, you'd have to be like a computer forensic expert to understand what the hell this guy's saying here. It would have to have com uh, committed, let's see. This search would have been purged from the WAL file once the tab was closed because it would have been committed to the database. At that time period, that the defendant highlights Miss McCabe's cellular phone shows several unrelated searches that were conducted and also show a deleted as deleted from the WAO file for Canton Girl Basketball and a YouTube music video. Okay, but I mean, how come 227 is associated with that search? The defense expert also located a picture artifact from the Safari cache records with a URL pertaining to how long does it take to digest food? When this URL is run, it brings up an image of a person with a plate of food on a counter before them, cutting up said food. Nah, you wouldn't type that in. The defense expert also located a picture artifact from the Safari cache records with a URL pertaining to how long does it take to digest food. Yeah, but maybe you typed that in and it led to the search result that had that picture on it. When this URL is run, it brings up an image of a person with a plate of food on a counter before them cutting up said food. There's no evidence of any search being made for that query in Miss McCabe's phone history. The defense expert also located a deleted screenshot of Brian Albert's contact information. The screenshot was created at 6.08 a.m. on January 29, 2022. A review of the call logs shows that Miss McCabe's phone makes calls to Nicole and Brian Albert's phone that morning. The first call to Nicole Albert's occurs at 6.07 and while listed as answered lasts for a duration of nine seconds. The second call to Nicole Albert occurs at 6.08.17 and while also listed as un answered lasts for seven seconds. Calls that go to voicemail register as answered. Boom. The call to Brian Albert occurs at 6.23 as listed as unanswered. Brian Albert 
contacts uh, information was not deleted from the phone and was still present within within it when Miss McCabe signed her voluntary consent to search and download it. The defense expert also highlighted and reviewed health and location data from both Miss McCabe and Mr. O'Keefe's cellular phones. Counsel for the defendant states that this data unequivocally shows that Miss McCabe was up all night pacing around second floor of her home and that Mr. O'Keefe entered the residence on Fairview omitted uh, from the defendant's motion is the fact that the same data relied upon that supposition also reveals that Mr. O'Keefe presumably took 133 steps at 8.08 a.m., 68 steps at 8.25, 87 steps at 7.57, and 81 steps at 11.06, 109 steps at 118 a.m., and 46 steps at 11.56. Mr. O'Keefe was pronounced dead at the Good Samaritan Hospital at 7.50. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So that means they have him moving around his. I mean, does somebody have his watch, though? Or I mean, he was pronounced dead at 750 a.m. Yet it shows that he's moving around after that. The defendant's motion also highlights that Mr. O'Keefe's data indicates that between 1221 and 1224 a.m. his health data reads that the phone ascended, descended three floors and therefore Mr. O'Keefe must have entered the home on Fairview. To call this data unreliable is an understatement. Trooper Garino analyzed this health data and cross-referenced it with the native location in Celebrite and the location data in Axiom belonging to John O'Keefe's phone. Trooper Garino located a Waze search for the 34 Fairview address conducted at 1220. That makes sense. Waze is the, one of the mapping programs and 1220 is right at the time when let's see we go to 1220 up here. Jennifer arrives at 34 Fairview. 1218, Jennifer McKeever receives a call from the victim and answers it. Victim first ping in the neighborhood. So right around 1218, um, John calls Jennifer. And right here it's uh, 1220. Uh, let's see. He does a search at 12 seconds. So right after talking to her, he types in a search here, right? At 12.20.08 a.m. on January 29th, the native location then depicts Mr. O'Keefe's phone traveling on Dedham Street and arriving at the residence at 12.24. So that totally makes sense. Therefore, Mr. O'Keefe's phone would have ascended, descending within the Fairview residence prior to his arrival at the residence. The location data Next entry is in the vicinity of 34 Fairview Road at 1259 in the same location. A check of the location data in Axiom shows the location of at 34 Fairview Road and speed meters seconds 12, 12.25.36 a.m. with a speed of 0.63 uh, meters a second. The location data stays constant at 34 Fairview Road with no speed being registered until 6.15 a.m. with a speed of 0.04 meters a second. <laughs> hey, thanks, Elaine. I appreciate it. All right. Well, anyways, that's uh, pretty much... That document, but there, there seems like there's some stuff in here that's, you know, almost intentionally leaving out. Like, why not put in here that her, you know, Carrie Roberts and Jennifer McCabe 
were all in the same vehicle together when they showed up at 34 Fairview, right? I mean, isn't that kind of important information? Let's see what Ryan Nagel's interview says. So he's the guy that picked up his sister. Did we read this one yesterday? I don't remember doing it. We could have, though. On January 29, 2022, at approximately 6.04, Canton Police Department received a 911 call from a woman. Let me just move down here. Uh... The three females on the scene were identified by Canton Police Department Karen Reed, Jennifer McGabe, and Carrie Roberts. Additionally, a male party was identified as being in the area the night prior and possibly could have witnessed the victim arriving in the area of 34 Fairview. The said male was identified as Ryan Nagel, who was contacted by his sister Julie Nagel, asking for a ride home while visiting with her friend Brian. Uh, Albert at 34 Fairview uh, Ryan came into Norfolk District Attorney's Office for a pre-scheduled interview on Monday February 7th 2022 at 2 35 p.m. The following is a summary of information requested and provided by Ryan during the interview with Trooper Proctor and me Ryan confirmed that he was contacted by Julie requesting a ride home at the time Ryan was with his friend, Richie D.N. Uh, Tuono, who was driving his gray in color Ford F-150 pickup truck with Ryan seated in the front passenger seat and Ryan's girlfriend, Heather, seated in the back passenger compartment. Ryan recalls Richie driving down Cedar Crest Road from the direction of Kennedy Elementary School Uh, let's see that school's probably up here well, that's Canton High School yeah so he's they're coming in from this direction Actually, the house is over here. Let's see. Cedar Crest. Back passenger here calls. Richie driving down Cedar Crest Road from the direction of Kennedy Elementary School. As the F-150 approached Fairview, Ryan remembers seeing a set of headlights of a mid-sized black SUV coming from the opposite direction of Cedar Crest. Consequently, Richie yields to the vehicle, allowing it to make a right-hand turn onto Fairview. Okay, so he he's on he's on Cedar Crest like this. He's like right there. And what, what, wait, what direction was it? Oh, so they would have taken a right-hand turn. Let me see. I'm just going to read that again. Ryan remembers seeing the set of headlights of a mid-sized black SUV coming from the opposite direction. Driving down Cedar Crest Road in the direction of, from the direction of Kennedy Elementary School, seeing a set of headlights of a mid-sized black SUV coming from the opposite direction of Cedar Crest, yield to the vehicle, allowing it to make a right-hand turn onto Fairview. So that means it was kind of like this. Like, he's driving like this. Right? And then Karen's coming around like that, and he had to stop Basically, right here, 
So he was right there and he had to stop and allow that turn, that vehicle, Karen Reed's vehicle, to make a right turn there. And then he followed behind Karen Reed's vehicle. Does that make sense? So here is Cedar Crest Road. He's driving this way. Karen Reed's coming like this. He yields for her to take a right. And then he turns here and now he's right behind her. Yeah, so subsequently Richie yielded to the vehicle allowing it to make a right hand turn on the Fairview and then they followed making a left hand turn on the fair on the Fairview see there you go Ryan told us that Richie stopped the F-150 50 directly in front of the driveway belonging to number 34 Fairview and remembers the black SUV stopping along the right hand curb towards the left side of the property yeah, I mean, so this is exactly what we were talking about. So this is where he pulls up right here. Uh, Ryan told us Richie stopped the F1 directly in front of the driveway, right? So Richie parked right there, and Karen Reed's vehicle was right there next to the flagpole. Ryan told us that Richie stopped the F-150 directly in front of the driveway belonging to number 34 Fairview and remembers the black SUV stopping along the right hand curve toward the left side of the property as you look at the home from the street. When asked, Ryan stated he did not observe any erratic operation by the SUV as it turned from Cedar Crest onto Fairview or at any point while in the in his presence. Ryan went on to say that their F-150 remained in front of the home for a period of time that was no longer than five minutes, at which time his sister Julie came out of the home and asked if he if the three of them would like to come inside. Ryan refused the invite and Julie stated that she wanted to stay a while longer and would most likely spend the night at 34 Fairview. Upon conclusion of their conversation, Julie retreated back inside the home and Ryan noticed that the SUV pulled up a few feet to the far edge of the property uh, line between number 34 and the neighboring property where the flagpole was located along with some bushes. Ryan stated that the SUV driver did not appear to place the vehicle in the park as the rear brake lights were illuminated to include the third top center light at the initial positioning and after it had pulled up. I mean, who the hell's noticing that kind of stuff? The proc uh, Trooper Proctor asked Ryan if at any point he heard screams, yelling, or any noise coming from the black SUV while he was on Fairview, to which he stated no. Ryan added that as Richie pulled away from 34 Fairview, their F-150 drove past the black SUV, at which time Ryan observed the interior uh, light on and a Caucasian female operator seated inside the vehicle holding the steering wheel at the two and or 10 and 2 uh, clock position looking straight ahead. Now looking straight ahead of her. Ryan told us, that he did not see anyone else inside the passenger compartment during his brief observation of the SUV. As they drove by, Ryan did not see the SUV leave and did not note any damage to the vehicle as he remembers. When asked, Ryan stated that it had just started snowing approximately half an hour prior and there was a coating of snow on the ground. While present in the area, uh, Cedar Crest and Fairview, Ryan did not see any other vehicles operating besides the F-150 and the black SUV. Without having anything further to provide about the evening, Trooper Proctor and I concluded the interview. So anyways, you know, I mean, I'm not really even sure what 
that victim provides other than just saying, yep, I saw her. She was there. I mean, the thing is, Karen Reed admits to being there, right? So why, why I don't know, understand why that's a big deal. She says she dropped him off. Thank you, wise child. All right, I'm going to use the uh, restroom, everybody. Maybe we'll play some uh, some music here. Maybe help uh, see if you guys want to help support the channel. You never know. Play the old. Uh... There we go. And there's some really huge files in here. I mean, the problem is there's just there's so much stuff, and um, you, I mean, you could just go over. It. I mean, I, we, if you want, we could go over one of the Turtle Boy pages. You know, he's some guy that was been out there, but he's been arrested for like I don't know, a couple different elements. One of them, some sort of a domestic violence issue, and then another. But it's you know the same police department arresting him because he was working with the. Uh, Karen Reed. What do you mean the PCA? We've already gone over it. I don't know. It's just uh, <laughs> spending a lot of time on here. Probably not.
Now, doing both what things, Janice? We don't know what you're talking about. You have to have a full sentence. Yeah, it's not his real name. I mean, I see all these documents. I don't see the uh, something that's called probable cause, but it's like Commonwealth Memorandum. Um, I haven't seen it. Yeah. Why is that, Jim? All right, guys. Well, I think I'm going to call it a night. I don't really have anything else to uh, do, and it's not really generating a lot of interest on here. So I appreciate you guys uh, being here, and, uh, you know, that's where, you know, it's just an interesting story out there. I'm not really sure if I'll keep covering it. It's one of those things where, uh, you know, the channel really suffers covering it and it's you know while it's interesting uh, you got a lot of other people covering it non-stop and looks like they have a there'll be a court hearing coming up soon and you can see on you can see we just got creamed again <laughs> on the show again covering this case so uh yeah give it a shot though give it a shot there's a whole bunch of articles out there um, you know, you can watch court TV interviews. They're out there. I just think it's, you know, I'm just covering the parts. And now if you want to come up with conspiracies and proof of that, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of different things out there. But, uh, you know, as just as a question, do you think, like, the reason, like... <laughs> The, uh, the it's so slow is it's the case right because if I cover you know uh, Delphi or the Idaho 4 or something like that it seems that the channel does a lot, hell of a lot better you know and I'm not really sure you know you know 213 people watching etc it's not really it's not working yeah hey thanks Amber D what do you think, Gray? Is she guilty? I think, uh, I do. I, I mean, here's what I think. I think she ran him over, and the police are, are turned it into something way bigger to try to, and I think that's where the, I don't know, though, you know, so it's kind of weird because you seem like you had this, you know, <laughs> the the one girl what was her name Jennifer like she was so McNab like she just seems so interested in McCabe I mean I mean she seems so interested in him so that part bothers me like over and over again and everybody's like yeah yeah come you know come to this bar and then he goes to the bar and then later they're invited over even though the homeowners didn't know that or claim they didn't know that they were invited over but I mean, what was the point? So it's an accident that he gets killed and instead they find a video or something or they talk about, they quickly come up with a story how her car went down the street and then backed up, turned around and, you know, it, it seemed to move that direction and then move this direction and boom, boom, boom. And they use that to pin an entire murder of somebody that they killed and placed in that same spot on the street. Doesn't that sound wild to you guys a little bit? Like uh, other people say, yeah, we see the SUV there. Hey, 
He got beat up and our dog killed him. Why don't we put him on the grass right next to where his girlfriend's car was and let's say that they got along all night to everybody. I don't know, it just seems convoluted a little bit. Yeah, I don't believe that backing up thing, Rick. I don't believe the backing up uh, her tail light hitting anything. Yeah, so those things therefore mean she's innocent, right, Rick? Okay. Yeah, and then there's ones by hit by a car. Yeah. So what? But what? What does Karen Reed? What is her responsibility here? So Karen Reed just dropped him off and drove home. And why was she hysterical when he wasn't home at four something? Why was she hysterical? Can anybody explain that? You, you're the one that dropped him off at a party after 12 and you're hysterical at four something because he's not home? Wouldn't you be just kind of... Yeah, yeah. So Rick said, you need to research a little more. I don't know. I'm just saying that's my feeling of it. Like I said at the beginning of the show, the feds have been looking into the investigation of the case, and they've come up with something that's coming out. Well, no, but that's that's. But see, Rick, you're just making you're just saying what you want to say, so that it matches your story. I think she was more pissed than hysterical, even though her niece and the person she called said she was hysterical. Okay, but you want to say, oh, she was just pissed. That's because you want it to be that way. You know, who knows? Oh, Jesus. Oh, oh God. You're, so, you're an expert now. You come in and you didn't even know anything about the case, and now you know what the answer is. Good Lord. Even on tonight's show, you didn't even have a clue about the date or anything, and now you're saying, I kind of think she's innocent. <laughs> Yeah, because you need to have the, you want the girl, uh, I mean, it could be, it could be. Ah, oh, Jesus. Okay, Jesus Christ. Uh, you, know, you weren't even paying attention. I think the corruption in this case will make the department look like a, yeah, I think it could be that something like that was, um, I think it definitely could be. You know, the, the feds are looking into it, so you never know what they'll come up with. It's amazing. Yeah, there, there's nothing I read today that would make you go, oh, man, she's innocent today. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing I read that would make you think that. Uh, you know, the, the phone information, they, they have an explanation of why it looked like the phone call came in, but at the same time, I mean, if it's true that she made the, not the phone call, the internet search of how long does it take to die in the cold or whatever, um, you know, that's bad. Right, right, you, right. You always want to be part of the cool crowd, though, Zozo. You know, the ones that, oh, I think she's innocent because I guarantee you, you looked it up and saw where the wind was blowing. I, I guarantee it. All right. Uh, how is he going to get home? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe he's going to get a ride from good old Jennifer. Who knows? Very well could be, you know. But there's nothing that we read tonight that makes it seem that way. Mm -hmm. Get a ride, right? Uh -huh. Don't you think her car would have a lot more damage if she... That's what I always said. If you hit somebody hard enough to where it actually knocks them out and they end up dying because they can never wake up, it seemed like you would just destroy that back light. Let's see. Still great question. Frantic knowing she dropped him off. Still a great question, Cindy. I mean, 
Jay, and why would Karen be frantic knowing she dropped them off? Huh? That's what I just said. I guess Turtle Boy's the reliable source. I mean, he thinks she's innocent. And Zozo up there just said that how would you how could you trust anybody named Turtle Boy? But by God, he thinks she's innocent, so he must be very reliable. I think everybody should go read Turtle Boy's journals. Pulled up seconds after she did. No John in the car, in the on the ground. Then Lucky saw no body at 2.30, but did see a black Ford Edge at 3 a.m. Yeah, that part bo bothered me, the car parked there. But so why was she, so you think at this point, I guess it's uh, possible if you look at it like that, that when he drove by, he only saw a female in the car because he had already gotten out and he's in the house at this point, right? So he's already in the house and then um, and then she, she's outside texting him, you bastard, you bastard, you know, screaming at him on the phone, just like they said and everything, but he's already in the house and then she ends up driving away. Is that what you're, is that what the theory is? <laughs> hey, that's the wrong face though. So you got to have the one with the, uh, the side eye. Where is that one? Hold on. I can never find that one for some reason. Oh, there it is. I got it. That's the one right there. I mean, they weren't getting along, and he wanted her to move out. So that do, people do believe the kid's story, right? Right? People do believe the kid's story. See, what, what makes this one weird is that there's two sides that make sense. I mean, what makes the most sense is that she was really angry at him and she ran him, she, um, like, he got out of the car and then started walking towards his house and she backed into him because she was angry at something because she was already yelling. But it, what's weird to me, though, is like uh, she's yelling on his phone after being in front of the house there. So why would she do that if she knew that she hit him? I mean, you could claim that she's trying to set up an alibi for herself. Like, oh, I thought he was alive, so I was. Yeah, we've talked about that. We've done this two days in a row. Yeah, she, she was out in front, inside the house. They wit they said that, I mean, do you guys believe what the people in the house said, that she stopped and then she pulled forward again? And he even said that too. I mean, Nagel said exactly the same thing as the people inside the house, that she was in one position and then moved forward. So th are, you, are we all saying that Nagel... And everybody in the house all conspired together and came up with this exact little plan. I mean, because Nagel said it, so did two or three people in the, or two or three people looking out the window. I remember even commenting yesterday saying, wow, why are all these people looking out the window at a car <laughs> at this house? It's amazing. Aren't they inside chatting with everybody? What do you mean not Nagel? I just I just explained it to you. He did, he did say that. Remember how he said she pulled forward more than she was, but never turned the brake lights off? Yeah, he did say that. He said exactly the same thing they said. That it was, you know, in front of the house, and then it moved forward towards the flagpole area. Okay, so uh, if if that's true, though, dot good. Was John already in the house, and they all knew that, but they just kept watching her outside? <laughs> I don't know. That just seems weird to me. 
it seems like that they were waiting uh, that Jennifer was waiting for John to get there right I don't know because they probably thought he stayed in her car Zozo wouldn't that make sense so what you'd say is why didn't Karen look well see the, here, here's the thing nobody in the house would look for John because they just figured he stayed in the car with Karen and drove away Karen wouldn't look for John because she knows that she ran over him and wouldn't go back looking for him either so that's why when she showed up with the other two friends she immediately sees him through the blizzard and nobody else saw him like they were like what are you talking about oh wow how did you see him right i don't know i don't i don't i'm just going with like you know the basic generic information you know, you can see how police might think she did it based on the information that you see here. But there is, you know, like I said, a federal investigation going on on the investigation itself ongoing. <laughs> OK, and I guess it was ongoing. And it sounds like now they've come up with information and there's there's actually going to be a hearing soon where, uh, you know, both sides will have to figure out what they're going to do. They've postponed the trial. That's how severe something is. I think that's pretty interesting. Right, I just said that earlier in the show, Rick, that the timing, uh, that part, she's at the house. You hear her on a call. But, you know, people aren't looking at their watches, so she could have just said tw around 12.45 and didn't really know. So you can't really, there's a lot of that stuff that goes on in cases, like in the Idaho 4 case when somebody says, oh, around 4 o'clock. Oh, it's 4. No, it's 4 exactly. Well, no, it's, you know, it could be 408. You know, nobody really knows. But, um, you know, Karen Reed's already home at 1240 based on the audio with her high heels hitting the floor and different sounds inside of uh, John uh O'Keefe's house right she's already at home now you keep typing in key point but you're, how many key points do you got there uh, well that's because it's underneath the snow Rick yeah yeah and then some somehow a bunch of tail light was found at 6 p.m. Then I, there was another piece that was found when, like one of the head police officers or whatever drove by and he just happened to see it. <laughs> you know, but you're talking about you know six in the morning, uh, blizzard, heavy snow condition. You know, it's probably hard to see a, a some lights on the ground, don't you think? Oh, man, you're, you're, you sound like a conspiracy nutter there, Rick. Put Proctor behind bars unless he gives up who told him to plant evidence. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, who knows? Okay. There are discrepancies. You guys will recognize them if you continue. Yeah, we've already found a whole bunch of them. Not good. I've, just, I've said them all. Uh, a whole bunch of them. Not all, obviously. There's a whole bunch of them. But I'll tell you where there's discrepancies is, you know, the document that you guys all rely on, the one written right here, this one, this thing here has a whole bunch of errors in it, you know, uh, and almost like intentionally left out specific information to support the general narrative, the general narrative that's out there. Yeah. All right. We just showed him earlier. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Like, yeah, give, give me an example, Doc. Good. Let's get an example. I mean, it's, it seems weird how Jennifer got so involved, you know, like just calling all over the place and, you know, I mean, maybe Karen sold it, the story to her. Go ahead, uh, Doc Good, where, give me, give me an example. We're waiting. Uh, one three-point turn was first way they said she did it. I just think she backed up over him if she did it. Like, if you just look right here, look how obvious this is. The car is facing that way. John gets out of his passenger seat, and they're angry. She's mad or whatever, and starts walking this way. Then she just backs up a little bit on the lawn and smashes him with the back taillight and runs over him. And then she just goes back this way again and takes off. Does that make some sense? Yeah, it definitely is, um, then they switched to her going 60 feet in reverse. Well, maybe they changed their, their uh, opinion on it. I mean, why do people, you know what I think is funny? It's like when somebody has a theory and then they change the theory later, all of a sudden that means they're covering something up. You know, just like in the Idaho case when they thought the Elantra was a certain years, uh, 2011 to 2013, and then later they go, well, it actually could go to 2016. They go, see, look at that. They're trying to make it fit the... And it just, it's weird. It's weird to me. I, it doesn't bother me when police change their opinion on something at all. It just never, it never has. Isn't that, isn't that cool? Uh, see how there's little designs right here? Like the little circle and then the little thing like that. Watch. See, it's right there. Isn't that crazy? Even on satellite footage, you see the exact same little loop and then the circle going around. One, two, three, four branches off there. And you go down to the street view, look down, and there it is. One, two, three, four, boom, and then the little loop. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, we, we, we know, Rick, Rick, we just read that a minute ago. So when you say, no, Gray, Ryan Nagel, his friend in the car, and his sister, Julie, they came out of the house, didn't see John in the car or the ground. She dropped him off before she pulled forward. Yeah, we, we already said that, Rick. Try to pay attention a little bit, you know. We already said that a thousand times already. Thank you. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Right, well, then don't say no gray when you just tune in, Rick. You know, that's the part that bugs people a lot. Like, you weren't even here. If you just tuned in, you say, no gray, right? Now. What, what were you even referring to? What, what uh, part of the conversation since you've been here were you referring to when you said that? It's amazing. Sixty feet in reverse. It, yeah, it makes more sense the, the in reverse. I don't know if it was, you know, that I have her driving. I mean, just looking at it logically, he gets out of the right side of the car, she pulls forward, and then she's really pissed off, and then backs up over him again and knocks him over onto the ground right in this area here. And that would take out the, you know, dam do some damage to the right back tail light, et cetera. Even the township worker put a marker on the pavement. 
That's more of the cover up. Even the what? What are you talking about? I mean, can't you guys get? Don't, aren't you getting the vibe of the um, Idaho Four case here, you guys? The mentality of the pro Karen people. I mean, it's just like. Right, but you said no gray. You see what I'm saying? As if you were correcting me on something, and you said exactly what I said. So, you know, I don't, I don't care if you're fixing something, but to say exactly what I just said and say you're fixing something, it's a little weird, isn't it? Is it much worse? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Vinny's uh, Politan's been covering it quite a bit on. Court TV, he seems pretty like like he's never seen a case like it, but you know. Mm-hmm. Well hell, I was just about out of here a minute ago, now I'm still sitting here. But uh, as you can see we're only we only made it to forty eight percent of the goal, which is not good. The fence is paying influencers to push. They are who? <laughs> Why don't they pay me? I wouldn't do it though. That's the thing is I wouldn't do it. You know, I wouldn't care what they said. I'm going to do what the reality is. I just don't think they pay people. Uh, something to what? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I should do a, a poll then. There we go. And that whole video where the car backs up and nicks maybe John O'Keefe's car and they say, see, that's where the damage happened. I mean, give me a break. My God. You don't even see it move the car at all. And if it did, it's just the smallest little crack in the world. Not enough to, I guess that would be the argument. I guess one way to look at it, though, is it doesn't look like there's a tremendous amount of damage on the back right of her vehicle, even on that video, regardless if it hit that car or not. There's hardly any damage to it. And you would think that if you smashed into somebody hard enough where they're knocked out for hours, not even waking up in the cold, that you'd have significantly more damage on the back of that vehicle. That's what I would say. Uh, when is that? Uh, when was that statement made, Rick? What do you mean the? I I read some stuff, but I never read that quote. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know if that was said or not. I, I watched uh, a description of the court hearing, and that definitely wasn't something that was said that I heard. So, Now, let's see what they have here. This is just a timeline. Let's see what it says in this uh, WCVB 
Prosecution document reveals alleged timeline and death of Boston police officer John O'Keefe. We'll see what they say. 7.37 p.m. O'Keefe is seen on surveillance camera video arriving at C.F. McCarthy, McCarthy's in Canton. 8.51 Reed is seen on the video arriving at C.F. McCarthy's. At 8.58 bartender hands Reed a glass of containing clear liquid with a lime in it. 9.15 bartender hands Reed another glass. 9.20 bartender hands Reed another glass. 9.33 bartender hands Reed another glass. 9.57 bartender hands Reed another glass and a shot glass with clear liquid in it. And you know what people are forgetting is that how Karen Reed, according to other people, she said, I killed him, I killed him, didn't I? I must have killed him. I mean, why would you even assume something like that if you just dropped somebody off? Why would you say that out loud to anybody? And you would think that uh, he's, she said something similar to the, when the paramedic was there. So does he say anything about that? Uh, a lot of people would, Terry. A lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Who would purposely assault and leave somebody to die in their own front yard? Oh, you mean in their yard? I thought you were talking about in anybody's yard. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of a good point. I mean, why not just dump his body somewhere else? And then, by the way, how did they move his body to that location? Are, are there any cameras anywhere out there that would have filmed that happening? I think I was mentioned earlier that there's footage missing. Yeah, like she was absolutely wasted, right? 957, bartender hands read another glass and a shot glass. Bartender hands read another glass. Video shows Reed and O'Keefe leaving the bar. Reed is seen holding her la latest drink in her hand. Like she just doesn't want to get rid of her drinks. I mean, she carried a drink from C.F. McCarthy's over to the waterfall. And then she's leaving the waterfall with another drink in her hand. I mean, my God. O'Keefe and Reed are seen on video arriving at the waterfall bar at 1054. At 12.10 a.m., Reed exits the establishment with two women through the front door. O'Keefe exits moments later after taking a sip from his glass and carrying the drink out in his right hand. So he has his drink. 12.11, video shows O'Keefe carrying a glass. Yeah, that's that part. 12.14, O'Keefe sends a text asking a friend where to. Well, that's, you know, it's not just the friend. That was uh, Jennifer. No, no, it wasn't Jennifer. It was the wife of the homeowner. He receives a text with an address on Fairview Road from the sister of the homeowner. Oh, that's right, the sister of the homeowner. Uh, the vehicle consistent with Reed's SUV seen on video traveling past the Canton Town Library. Hold on. Now I have to go back to that original document again. And by the way, we're still on the show, everybody. So if you're out there and you can help support my channel, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we're having one of those poor nights again. So I could really re use your support to allow us to keep uh, doing these shows and to, you know, again, make a big difference at the end of the month. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Oh, yeah. So it was Jennifer McCabe. So victim text Jennifer McCabe, where to? All right. So they leave that out of the, the story there, <laughs> who it was. Yeah, where to? Vehicle consistent with Reed's SUV. Seen on video traveling past the Countentown Library. It's seen moving past Beth Abraham, uh, Abraham at 1217. And then O'Keefe calls to ask more specifics because they're kind of lost, I guess. Then the homeowner sister sends O'Keefe a text message saying hello at 1231. 1240, she sends another message saying pull up behind me because she sees the SUV outside referencing her vehicle in the driveway. She said that 
subsequently watched the black SUV move from its initial place where it had stopped near the driveway to the far left side of the property near a flagpole. And then this is Nagel here. I'm just remembering. The neighbor property where the flagpole was located. Uh, she re entered back into the house. They don't really have a time. So this is, well, this says February 7th. Uh, this is when the interview was. Um, I wish I had a time here. Hey, thanks, Dot Good. which Ryan observed the interior light and he does mention the same thing though. Now oh, there it is right here. Upon conclusion of their conversation, Julie re-entered inside the home and Ryan noticed that the SUV pulled up a few feet to the far edge of the property line between number 34. All right, so that's Nagel and that seems to confirm right here she sends another message saying, pull up behind, referencing her vehicle in the driveway. She said she subsequently watched the black SUV move from the initial place where it had stopped near the driveway to the far left side of the property near a flagpole. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly the same thing. So don't those two right there confirm that? I mean, what are the odds that would they would both say that they noticed that exact same thing if it didn't happen? Uh, between 1.30 and 2 a.m., another guest at the Fairview Road home gets a ride and indicate, indicated that she thought she saw th something she described as a dark object in the snow by the flagpole, but could not determine what it was. Now, a lot of people don't like that one because they said that she said that in an interview way, like, months later. 4.53 a.m., the sister of the Fairview Road homeowner receives a call from Reed who is looking for O'Keefe and instructed O'Keefe's niece to place the call. 5 a.m., Reed calls a second friend stating that O'Keefe did not come home and she was worried. According to the prosecution, Reed also told her, I wonder if he's dead. It's snowing. He got hit by a plow. I mean, doesn't that sound like you already have knowledge that he's been hit and he's on the side of the road? <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, that, that's just crazy. Then 5.11 a.m. library surveillance video captures a large black SUV turning onto Washington Street towards the waterfall. Thanks, Nikki Zubz. 5.15, the same camera captures SUV traveling the opposite direction towards Temple. 519, a camera at the temple captures the SUV passing. 5.30 a.m., Reed and the friend arrive at the home of the sister of the Fairview Road residence. Yeah, so I think what they're suggesting here is that Karen Reed drove by the house again somewhere in this time frame here, like a, between 5.18 and 5.30. She drove by the house. And I'm wondering if, the, if it, at that time she sees his body in the yard. And that's why then she goes nuts. And, you know, Reed and a friend arrive at the home of the sister of the Fairview Road residence. That's Jennifer McCabe, where she is described as hysterical. One of, so, you know, doesn't that sort of fit? That between 515, 518 and 530, that Karen Reed sees the body and then is hysterical moments later one of the women drove reed back to o'keefe's house while the other followed in her own vehicle so that part wasn't mentioned in that other document that we we're reading the long you know the the one that was, that was put out there for public use for you know sleuthy goosey it doesn't mention that right there it leaves that out
No, it's okay. I don't. I. I don't know. I thought I had an O apostrophe Keith in it or something. Maybe I left the apostrophe out. I don't know. It's it has it's absolutely irrelevant to what we're talking about here. You kind of just threw me off. What the? Uh, did I hit him? You could just send me an email on something like that. Um, one of the women drove Reed back to O'Keefe's house while the other followed in her own vehicle. During that drive, she told investigators that Reed said, Could I have hit him? Did I hit him? See, it seems like she's already seen him sitting there on the ground, don't you think? We're going to look like fools? <laughs> we're just looking at it the way, we're just reading what, what's out there, Jay. I know that you're a genius, and the rest of us are all complete morons, but uh, we're just kind of going over the case, all right? He came in like a wrecking ball. Dun, 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 dun. What an idiot. Jesus. Anyways, uh, my apologies. I just tuned in. Shut the hell up, man. <laughs> God. You come in and you call everybody names and you say, my apologies. I just joined in. Yeah, go after yourself, man. What an idiot. Uh, let's see, 5.30 a.m. Reed and the friend arrive at the home of the sister of Fairview Road residence where she is described as hysterical. One of the women drove Reed back to O'Keefe's house while the other followed in her own vehicle. During that drive, she told investigators that Reed said, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? And if you notice right here, she's driving by in the same area as she did after when they went to the 34 Fairview house after leaving the bar. She's in the same area between 518 and 530, and now she's hysterical. You know, but, uh, but, uh, but at this time, though, isn't Reed with that other friend? So maybe that, would, that, may, that friend would know that she saw somebody or not. Because she's falling behind, right? Other follow in her own... Vi no? So it says, Reed and the friend arrive at the home of the sister of the Fairview Road residence where she is described as hysterical. So the friend is following her. I know. That's interesting, though. Reed and okay, so then at O'Keefe's house, Reed showed the other women the cracked taillight. So why did she do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like she says, "Did I hit him? Look at I've got a cracked taillight here." All three women then go into the same car and went to go look for O'Keefe. The friend who was driving said it was snowing heavily with poor visibility when they arrived, but she noted that Reed immediately said she saw the victim when the other woman could not see it lying on the snow. So Reed said, oh, there he is. And then the other women were like, where? What are you looking at? Uh, 6.04 a.m., 911 call from a woman reporting a man later identified as O'Keefe was found in the snow. The first Canton police officer to arrive saw three women waving at him from the front yard near a flagpole and fire hydrant. Two of the women were performing CPR on the victim. The other observed the victim, uh, the officer observed the victim was cold to the touch and was not breathing. Footage from a camera attached to the officer's cruiser shows dark blizzard conditions. All right, so that's why you couldn't see the lights, you know, the pieces of plastic on the ground in a rational, you know, way. Like if you're literally just looking at it rationally right there and you say, well, that's why they didn't see those items right at that moment. Maybe they were there. Maybe they were planted. Don't know. Reed's SUV seized and taken to the Canton Police Department. Two pieces of red plastic taillight and one piece of clear plastic taillight. So notice right here where it says red plastic taillight. 
Now, you remember earlier in the chat here, somebody said they never even found any red tail plastic. Like, it was just, oh, it was white. It was clear. It was, they said that they didn't find red plastic tail light, but we, I actually read this in the documents. That's where this article came from, by the way. They were found by Massachusetts State Police Special Emergency Response Team members who dug through the snow. Prosecutors said the plastic was consistent with broken pieces of red SU, uh, Reed's SUV. Now, O'Keefe's cell phone was analyzed by Massachusetts State Police. Their forensic extraction of the call logs, voicemail, and text messages between the victim and the defendant, including the date of January 28th and 29th, detailed strains within their relationship, the victim's desire to end their relationship, and the defendant's description of their relationship with them and the two children together as toxic. An autopsy is conducted by the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. The doctor opined that extensive injuries to his head likely rendered Mr. O'Keefe incapacitated. The doctor further opined that upon viewing Mr. O'Keefe's injuries, and her examination of the body, she observed no signs of Mr. O'Keefe's uh, Keefe being involved in any type of physical altercation or fight. Members of the Massachusetts State Police Crime Scene Services section examine Reed's SUV and conduct tests, including a confirmation that the car's backup camera was con uh, functioning and alerted the technicians when it was approaching a dummy. So it would actually make a sound if you're about to hit somebody. Yeah, so that was one of the articles back then. Did we do the... interview with Nicole Albert. I think we read those yesterday. Yeah, even in reverse. To Lexus. Oh, uh, maybe I do have that. This is the this is the probable cause document right here application and probable cause yeah I remember seeing that yesterday so I do have that in here but uh, I'll probably have to save it for another time because we unless you guys want to go on a nice little uh, super chat binge right here we I'll do it but if not uh, we'll move on to a different day because this has been one of those, uh, you know, gone for three days, and man. Why are you scared to convict? What? I don't know what that means, Gene. Yep, she walks. What do you mean? When is she, when is she walking? Yeah, I mean, you can see, you know, there's things in there that uh, are contradictory to each other. But what seems more logical is that Karen Reed has something to do with it. You know, that, that makes more sense. You know, like, you can come up with these other things, but you, then you have to believe in some fantastical story where somebody got beaten up and then a dog attacked him and then somehow they dragged him out in the snow and placed him on the ground exactly at the same spot where Karen Reed's SUV just happened to be moving about. <laughs> and then, <laughs> you get what I'm saying? You see how crazy that is right there? Look, look how wild that sounds right there. That there is, and then every one of these people is telling something, is part of a cover-up story. They're in a house. He goes into the house and Karen Reed's just sitting out in the car fuming that he went inside. She's yelling at him in, in phone calls and 
all this kind of stuff and then she pulls forward for some unknown reason just kind of a uh, sort of a twitch she pulls forward and she stops again because she's really angry and he's inside and then somehow the guy that she was really 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 angry at that wanted that knew that wanted to kick her out of the relationship he's inside the house and randomly gets killed by people in that house and a dog attacks him too so it isn't just he got beat up a dog attacked him and then they were saying man we got to pin this on somebody does anybody remember yeah I remember karen reed's suv it was out in the front of the house and it was it was sitting there and it poop moved forward it was near that flagpole oh hey hey yeah let's put his body right next to that flagpole everybody and that'll sell the story just everybody keep it together yeah the car ran him over and, and make sure now listen what we need to do is sneak over and take a little chip out of the the uh the light back there i don't know man you don't see how that just sounds kind of crazy And not the fake one they tried to say plow the street. Huh? Karen pissed off the ring reader. Uh -huh. They're trying to make it. But how come Karen's the one that brought up the snow plow idea? She's the one that mentioned, man, maybe you got hit by a snow plow. So they heard it and they went, ooh, ooh, ooh. God, that's a great idea. So then Jennifer gets on the phone really quick and calls everybody up and spreads it around. The snowplow did it. Great idea. Mm Yeah, I mean, the, the whole federal stuff is interesting. You know, what is it that they're seeing that, um, you know, has people, you know, wondering and curious? You know, that's what I was saying at the beginning of the show. I said it right at the very beginning. I said, you know, you sort of have to picture things through the, the eye of the fact that the, you know, um, you know, federal agencies, the... Department of Justice is looking into the investigation of the Karen Reed case. Right now, what does that mean? Does that mean that all of this stuff is a conspiracy or were there things that were sort of overlooked and they went down a route of charging somebody with something that never should have gone this far down the road? Something like that. Yeah, let's see what it says. There's got to be something like coming up here. Yeah, so the the date that's been st uh, set back. And now the lawyers for Karen Reed case asked for delay for March murder trial. And the prosecutors, prosecutors defense moved to delay the March murder trial. See, and there was something about... Um, The parties anticipate that the information, so right here, uh, the filings say on January 17, 2024, the parties spoke in a conference call with a representative of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts, which said it would be producing information for both parties without giving a timeline. On February 7th, the parties said they received an email from the U.S. Attorney's Office Affirmative Civil Enforcement Division requiring a conference call. The parties anticipate that the information to be produced will impact the arguments to be made in favor of and or 
in opposition to the defendant's motions. So <laughs> it's weird. It's like it didn't say anything right there. It literally said it could be good or bad. It could be good or bad. The motion says if they receive the information before scheduled February 15th pretrial hearing, they will need time for further investigation. The motion also lists um, several items of evidence that still have not been produced, including records from Google, Verizon, witnesses, and the state police crime laboratory. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I'm going to go. All right, thanks for hanging out here. Uh, another struggle, struggling night. Thanks to Kami, Sirius Black, Robin. Thanks, Lemon Crush, at the end there. Kubi, Robin, B Sir, 8675309. This is C, WNC Granny, Kathy Chapin, Paulette Leonard, Timothy Cecil, Allie Cake, Peter N, Elaine, Wise Child, Amber D. Dot, good, zero new members tonight. Uh, Nikki Zubs and Lemon Crush. And thank you all very much for helping support the channel, the ones that did, and everybody else for hitting the, you know, hit that like button, do something. <laughs> for God's sakes. All right. Anyways, see you guys later. Thanks for being here. Uh, maybe tomorrow we'll try to do the... If we have one more day like this, though, I won't be continuing with Karen Reed stuff. Can't do it. Got to focus in on what's best for the channel. All right. So, I mean, it's interesting. And I think, uh, you know, the way we look at stuff is a little different than other people. And so, you know, you never know. I mean, we don't know what's going on in this case. So we'll try it one more night. And if, we, if it's another one similar, then... <coughs> Three strikes, done. Thanks for being here, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. And as I always say, until next time, be safe out there. Hey, by the way, when are you getting your? Uh, you got your new dog yet? Eight six yeah, seven five three zero nine. Crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a. Crime Dissector I already detector. have the problem because I just said that human lie detector. Gonna get oh, you. Everything I'm reading is court documents If you try and play me like an old projector Crime Sector Is my nectar Professor Gray is gonna give another look See Mrs. C typed in Hey maybe we can find court documents Probable cause docs for tomorrow we, We've only been reading court documents For two days now One regular article Just a minute ago the probable cause document I just showed you on the screen. We'll read that one tomorrow. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector, fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his back. Right, talking to the lady tomorrow. All right. Spectra. Just remember, I have a temple for conjecture. I have no agenda. I'm the pretender, and I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody, talk to you. Well, uh, what do you mean? Is it her birthday today or tomorrow? When is it? When is it? Danny ICU RN's birthday. Not probably because she weighs a lot, Zozo. Have you ever thought of that? Oh, well, we're going to have to get Mary Lou, Mary Lou to do Danny ICU RN's birthday. That was a sleep guy. Okay, well, you still got to sing happy birthday for Danny ICU RN, all right? Okay, here we go. <sighs> happy birthday to Danny ICU RN. Happy birthday to Danny ICURN. Happy birthday, dear Danny ICURN. Happy birthday to you. And many.
many more. And many more. Hey, what are you doing, Timmy? I wanted to say many more. But you're not the one that says many more. It's John Boy. Yeah, I say that. I know, but I wanted to. Ah, forget it, Timmy. Jesus. All right, we'll see you guys later. And be safe out there. But man, we gotta we gotta get get back up to normal here, you guys. This it doesn't work. It doesn't work.